Hey, good afternoon and good morning for those of you joining from the West Coast. Uh, sorry for the slight delay getting started today. Had a little technical difficulty. Just trying to hash out there, but we are good to go. So let's get started. So this is UVC disinfection technology in the post-coronavirus world. This is an AIA accredited webinar. So thank you to our AIA members who are uh, tuning in today. Uh, this is a 1LU HSW uh, course. So if you have, uh, if you're looking to get credits, please make sure that you provide us your AIA number. We will send a follow-up at the end of the webinar, uh, including a recording of the webinar. Uh, so if you haven't already, please provide that number and we'll get you your certificate. The other PSA before we really get started here is please use the uh, Q&A module that's built into Zoom to ask any questions throughout the uh, talk. We'll be using those to uh, answer questions. Things in the chat can get a little hectic and lost. So again, please do not use the chat, use the Q&A instead. And those questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. Without further ado, let's get started here. So my name is Dan Lipin. I am the co-founder and president at Pure Lighting Company. And on the side of germicidal lighting and UVC, uh, my areas of expertise are in theory uh, and development of products. Uh, my background is a bachelor's in electrical and computer engineering from Rutgers University, and I am a professional member of both the IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society, and the IUVA, the International Ultraviolet Association. And so we will go into some of the weeds with germicidal lighting and UV lighting. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we are a full scale engineer design dealer. Uh, we do have a manufacturing branch as well. And the reason that I make that evident and clear is that we're coming from an approach that is full spectrum uh, with germicidal lighting. And so we'll be able to go and dig in and provide answers to uh, essentially any query question that you have on the topic and for you architects if you want to carry this conversation forward we provide design specification demos and mock-ups project management uh, courses like this a accredited courses and webinars and with the uh, tail end of covid happening and with technologies that can make meeting in person uh, safe once again uh, which after this hour you'll be uh, pretty proficient and I would hope uh, we are doing in-person uh, webinars as well or excuse me in-person lunch and learns as well and that'll be either in the northeast or in the pacific northwest where I personally uh, live and reside some other upcoming uh, webinars we do have a monthly series so once a month uh, catch up with us for a free AIA accredited webinar next month we're doing stage and theater lighting for schools uh, that is another huge part of what we offer uh, as a company. We'll be diving into IAQ. We'll touch base on that a good amount today uh, in December with our IAQ IQ webinar. And just announced, not even on the website yet, uh, Lighting Controls 101, which we'll be doing in January, talking about all sorts of control from 0 to 10 to DMX, from wire to wireless, uh, app-based to software-based. Uh, so a lot of innovation there uh, and on a field that's so constantly and quickly changing. Uh, great discussions to be had. So let's start to dig in a little bit with our topic at hand. We have a lot to talk about. I'm going to go through it a pretty quick clip. Again, questions at the end. And I am more than happy to geek out and nerd out about these topics at any point. So I would be more than delighted to carry on this discussion uh, post hours. Uh, whether we want to do that via lunch and learn, whatever it might be. But we have a background to go through uh, IAQ and its importance. Um, we have some updates that came literally as early as last week there. We're going to talk a bit about the history of UV disinfection, where it comes from, the research that has been put into it thus far. And we're going to be talking about the importance of this technology in future building practices. We're going to demystify UVC, and there are a lot of uh, false narratives there. There's a lot of uh, questionable, um, I guess, information out there. So we're going to go and demystify and make lucid on what exactly UVC is and how exactly it's used. 
We'll go into some applications, of course, that's of interest, and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So let's start with some background. I like to start with the history of UV. We're not going to have a history class here. But the reason why we talk about this is if you look at this first date at top of the screen, 1801, UV light was first discovered. UV light is a natural phenomena. We'll talk about that in about four slides. Now, take it a century later, 100 years later, and the first UV lamp was commercialized. So we had the power to harness UV light for disinfection purposes for more than 100 years at this point. In fact, in 1904, a Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded for the usage of UV light in treating tuberculosis and other uh, pathogens, uh, especially those topical on the skin. And in 1910, first major UV water disinfection system utilized in Marseille, France. Water treatment, uh, food treatment, and surgical centers Pre-COVID were some major uses of UV light. And again, I point this out because in 1910, 1904, 1901, this is when UV light really first came into being used for the purpose that we're talking here. This means that we have over 100 years of scientific literature to refer to. This means that we have multi-generational studies. This means that we know everything that there is to know about a lot of these wavelengths and how they affect the pathogens, the, and the human body. I believe personally in uh, using safe tested technology. There are a lot of new technologies that come with a lot of promise, but they need to have a rigorous study before we can go and incorporate them into our high traffic shared spaces. And so UV light passes the test of time. That's why I like to go and highlight this. And of course, in the past couple of years, due to the pandemic, there's been a renewed usage of UV light, looking at it in terms of uh, its pathogenic of efficacy of reducing pathogens in a space in this post-coronavirus world, and also at looking at its ability to improve indoor air quality, especially in, again, these high traffic shared spaces where there are a lot of pathogens. And there's also a lot of other chemicals and pollutants in the air that obstruct our ability to perform and to feel well inside of these spaces. And on that side, so just last week, there is a large press uh, conference held by the White House to drum up support for their Clean Air and Buildings Challenge. This is a national endeavor to clean up indoor air quality inside of our high traffic facilities. And yes, this is going to be for the reduction of the risk of COVID-19 spread, as well as other pathogens, but also to improve and reduce things like VOCs, ozone, CO2, dust, pollen, and other pollutants and irritants in the air that, again, can cause uh, a whole slew of conditions and diseases. Uh, including things like headaches, fatigue, trouble concentrating, irritation of the eyes, nose, throat, and lungs, heightened uh, risk of asthma, and can lead to cancer uh, over years of exposure. This is straight from OSHA uh, before I showed um, straight from the EPA and from the White House official statement. Um, and again, when we're talking about IAQ, we're not just talking about pathogens, which is a huge issue that we need to address. Uh, they are saying that in the next uh, 25 years, there's about a 55-0% chance of a pandemic equal to or deadlier uh, than the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is barring any uh, proactive steps at reduction, such as what we're going to be talking about today. I'm not going to harp too much about IAQ. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, join me on the 15th of December. We'll have a whole hour where we really dive into IAQ, its importance, and different types of techniques and technologies that we can use to improve IAQ in new and existing facilities. Uh, but let's go and keep in the realm of UV light and that bandwidth. So UV light is a natural phenomenon. It is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum uh, hosts sorts of things that we're familiar with from X-rays, gamma rays, which will turn people into hulks, apparently, uh, to things like microwaves, which will go and cook our food through the whole visible light spectrum and all the beauty that that entails. So the 
Uh, part of the spectrum from 10 to 400 nanometers is what's called ultraviolet light. We're very familiar with ultraviolet light because ultraviolet light is what gives us our beautiful tans in the summer. And it is also what causes sunburn um, as well as mel uh, melanoma and some of those risks from overexposure of the sun. Now, there are multiple subsects of UV light. UVA we're familiar with. It's about 95% of the naturally occurring UV light on Earth. And this is what gets us our suntans. Uh, we have UVB. It's about 5% of what's naturally occurring. This penetrates deeper into the skin, has a higher energy than UVA. Uh, this is what causes sunburns, and this is highly carcinogenic. This is the reason why we wear sunscreen and limit our time outdoors. And then we have UVC, and that's going to be the crux of our discussion. UVC is from around 100 to 280 nanometers, uh, depending on what scientist you're asking. And it is completely absorbed by the ozone layer. So none of it is naturally occurring on the Earth. We have to go and manufacture it through special light fixtures or through special occurrences such as the arc of a welder's gun. Uh, and then we have some other UV, UVV or UV, depending on what you're looking at. Um, only occurs in vacuums, very specific, beyond the scope of this discussion. We'll stick with UVC. And so the way that UVC is going to operate is uh, it has a high enough energy and a small enough wavelength. And so what that means is that it could penetrate right into the DNA and RNA of pathogens, which are incredibly small to begin with. Once it gets in there, it starts to scramble the DNA and RNA, and it causes something called a thymine dimerization. And what that does is it takes uh, these thymines, binds them together instead of across, and that's going to disrupt the DNA. Technically, it doesn't kill pathogens, and that's actually an important uh, disclaimer to make. What it does is it sterilizes pathogens. So the pathogen can no longer replicate because it cannot replicate, it cannot infect. It's the replication inside of the body that causes damage and danger. Whether it's a virus, bacteria, mold spore, it doesn't matter. There is a subsect of UV, we'll talk about it a bit, called far UV, where it actually will disrupt the protein walls of gram-positive bacteria and viruses, and it's going to disrupt the walls, it's going to tear the virus or bacteria apart, and actually will kill, uh, but that'll be for a uh, discussion a little bit later on, and we don't have to drill in too much into that science. And so when we look at a properly utilized UV solution, and we'll talk about what proper means a little bit later, we find it to be effective. UV light can treat up to four log, uh, actually do five, six log reduction, so 99.99% up to 99.9999% reductions with the proper dosage. We'll talk about that a little bit later. It's safe. Now, Direct exposure of UV light uh, beyond the thresholds uh, provided by NIOSH, uh, N I O S H, or the ACGIH, uh, is going to cause a temporary skin irritation and eye irritation. When that isn't, um, first off, excuse me, that's not going to cause any long term damage. UVC is not found to be carcinogenic, it cannot penetrate deeply enough into the new cell generating parts of our skin or eyes. Also, the safeguards can be put into place, again, proper system. And there's a whole subset called FAR UV, which we should probably do a whole webinar on. Uh, we'll probably do that uh, sometime in the new year, where that at this point has been studied up to ridiculously high dosages and have found zero damage to eyes or skin. It's facility friendly, so this is going to allow for hands-free automated disinfection. Future ready, every pathogen that's been tested uh, has been uh, susceptible to UV. It's also, UV is also going to be able to treat our antibacterial resistant pathogens like our MRSAs and our C. diffs, which is going to be a very important tool because those pathogens are very hard to treat once infected. So the best way to remedy that is to be proactive. Versatile, a lot of different options for different budgets. And again, on the budget consciousness side, between the reductions of maintenance costs, chemical cleaner costs, and 
uh, looking at the costs associated with uh, potential spikes in works workers' comp, uh, there is a definable ROI associated. And so what we're finding is these IAQ improvement measures are becoming something that's standard in our newer constructions. And we are seeing huge investments, whether it's through ESSER funding in public institutions or through um, self-generated to go and recruit talent back into our offices um, or to bring in people uh, to our hospitals uh, you know, or nursing homes showing that there's proactive steps for treatment there. All right, so let's demystify a little bit. Uh, there might be some things that have been heard about UV light. And so I kind of want to uh, address some of those here. So SARS-CoV-2, um, I know it's been a talking point at this point, uh, Every time I give this webinar or this talk, this slide feels less and less, uh, I guess, of a heavy hitter because it's so well known that UV is extremely potent and extremely efficacious against SARS-CoV-2. It's a very small dosage that's required, a dosage that in most implementations can be achieved in a matter of seconds or in a, at most a couple of minutes. And there's a huge body of research showing that, and this is just for SARS-CoV-2, uh, we're seeing uh, families of orthopox virus, very susceptible orthopox virus, it's the family of the pox viruses, including chicken pox, small pox, horse pox, and the uh, big one nowadays, monkey pox. Uh, I don't have that one here because as said before, peer-reviewed literature is important. And since monkeypox is so new, we are just using uh, samples from similarly built viruses of the orthopox virus family to show the efficacy. SARS-CoV-2, there's amount of research. And we have amount of research for influenza, uh, rhinovirus that can cause the common cold, and up to pneumonia, C. diff, MRSA, uh, all sorts of the pathogens that we deal with on a regular basis. Now, when we talk about how efficacious UV light is, this equation right here is going to be uh, very, very important. And this is going to be something when we're looking at implementation of not commoditizing uh, disinfection lighting or systems, but taking a scientific engineered approach. Because in order to have the proper efficacy of disinfection, the proper dose has to be reached. Dose is calculated in lab. Uh, we'll look at the values of multiple labs under different settings, including different humidity, different mediums uh, that the actual virus or bacteria or pathogen is suspended in. And we'll go average that out and add on an extra buffer to be extra safe. But to achieve the proper dose, that is going to be a measure of the intensity of UV light and the time that the pathogen has been exposed to the light. And so on that side, a very, very strong UV light source will be able to do something that a weaker light source can do in a longer period of time. And so we have to go and make sure that we're achieving the proper uh, dosage. And this is actually one of the reasons why some of the facilities that we've seen um, that have struggled through COVID, but may have UV light inside of their HVAC systems, weren't effectively uh, disinfecting the SARS-CoV-2 particles passing through because the time passing was so fast that the proper dose wasn't able to be achieved to achieve the three, four, or five log reductions we're looking for. All right, and as a general rule, viruses tend to be very simple. Uh, bacteria, are going to be uh, pretty simple as well. Yeast might require about twice the dosage and molds are much harder to treat because they have a thick outer shell, uh, <laughs> kind of like an M&M, &M, uh, which will take a little more time to penetrate through. And again, there's been a amount of research and so we get to see all sorts of different pathogens that are scientifically proven to be treatable by UV light. Uh, here is a sample list. All right, let's go into the efficacy, dangers, and safety here. So again, long-term exposure to UVC light uh, at the 254 nanometer wavelength, which is one of the major wavelengths we'll, talk, uh, we'll be looking at. We'll talk about why later. 
can cause a temporary irritation of the skin and eyes. The skin is similar to a sunburn. The eyes is an effect called photokeratitis, also known as Welder's flash. Everything is passing within 24 to 48 hours. No long-term damage is accrued. Regardless, in a 254 nanometer system, safety measures should be in place to uh, limit or preferably completely avoid exposure uh, of uh, of occupants that can be done through sensors that can be done through scheduling that can be done through enclosing uv into a shielded container and passing the air through many different ways where you can apply uv light effectively we'll talk more about that uh, there is also again as mentioned before 222 uh, nanometer uv light that's going to be effective at reducing uh, any of those damages because again a lot of testing and the wavelength cannot penetrate at all into the eye or the skin uh, to do any sort of damage uh, to the body. Now, in terms of avoiding UV dangers, as mentioned, the best is to avoid direct exposure. Four times when work needs to be done, uh, protective glasses, long sleeves, things like that will be effective uh, at removing the damage. UV doesn't penetrate through opaque substances. Um, really at all. Um, it is a, it's a unique property of UV. It doesn't reflect too well. It doesn't penetrate through opaque substances, uh, but it will be absorbed by our small pathogens in the air. So it makes it, uh, it makes it a really nice, effective, safe system where it can be on literally next door. Uh, you could be on through and have a glass protective window like you see in a school, and it'll be completely safe for uh, occupants next door or in the area. And this is compared to some of our other types of treatment. So one thing that we've seen as a nation is with overuse of chemicals, there was at the onset of the pandemic, a about 55-0% uh, uptick in calls to poison control. And the main culprit of it wasn't the accidental ingestion of chemicals. It was actually the vapors uh, associated with chemicals. So a lot of people from smelling the uh, stark and strong chemicals were getting sick from it. This is something that we've seen in schools. We've seen in offices. And it is something we want to avoid the overuse of chemicals. Uh, when we saw before the OSHA IAQ page, you may have noticed that one of the irritants in the air is going to be the VOCs associated from chemical use. Uh, so being able to limit and reduce the amount of harsh disinfecting chemicals we're using in the space is going to improve IAQ, is going to create a safer facility, and we can use those chemicals uh, A properly with a proper wet time and the proper air time, and we can reduce the use with them. Uh, so again, we don't cause extra damage to our people or do more harm than good. All right. Uh, this is stuff we've talked about. I've already talked a little bit too long, so I'm not going to harp. Uh, UV light's been used in many applications, hospitals, nurses stations, schools, bathrooms, um, tried and tested. And so it's not a, a breakthrough technology. It's not a technology you're sticking your neck out to incorporate, but it is, again, tried and tested uh, tech. All right, so UV light implementations. Uh, there's many different ways they can be implemented, and they can accommodate very different budgets. Uh, we won't go too much into this right now, but as we start talking about the engineering uh, scope of it, we can talk more then. Uh, but knowing that quality of light is going to be important. We'll talk about different wavelengths. Uh, the controls and safety features are something definitely worth uh, incorporating and making sure that is uh, full of safety redundancies. Uh, and then again, properly tested equipment as well. There is an ROI. Uh, this is a quick ROI when we're comparing to chemical disinfection to a UV-based system. So with chemical disinfection, assuming a uh, disinfection Monday through Friday on a 260-day working year, uh, so again, Monday through Friday, uh, 
five cents per square foot of manual disinfection, which is a pretty conservative estimate for a 900 square foot classroom, assuming the cost per year is going to be just shy of $12,000. The same system, uh, take it with a UV approach that's going to clean surfaces or disinfect surfaces and air, uh, will cost about $4,000, including uh, the install materials, et cetera. So you get to see that there's a rapid ROI, four months, and we're not looking into reductions of absenteeism that are associated. We're not looking at reduction in workers' comp costs that's associated. Uh, we're not looking at any at the uh, reduction of manpower needed in these facilities that's associated. So there are a lot of costs associated with this. Uh, so if there is an implementation where you're looking to put this in, uh, and you understand the benefits of the people, but you know the building owner, whoever it is, needs some sort of dollar amount to verify and to support it. Uh, again, there is an ROI that can be associated and calculated. Okay, good. I went through the background pretty quickly because we're uh, I kind of started a little bit late today. I want to get you all out uh, within the hour as promised. And I want to leave plenty of time for applications because I think that for the architects and the engineers who are on, this is probably the most interesting point. And I can answer the uh, stuff on the background and theory in Q&A. So let's dive in. So I mentioned before that a UV-based system, honestly, any germicidal or disinfection-based system needs to be looked at as an engineered solution. This is not a commodity good. And I'm sorry for being redundant, and I'm sorry for being a little bit stubborn and uh, maybe a little irritating with this, but I'm going to repeat myself and say this is not a commodity good, and it should not be treated as such. Uh, I know that Amazon has improved since the onset of the pandemic, but if you looked at Amazon in 2020, early 2021, they had a slew of commodity-based products and different air purifiers, wands, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of those were full-on dangerous uh, to use. We're doing a lot more harm than good. And so taking a scientific educated approach to make sure the proper dosage is achieved, the proper safety measures are set in, the proper functionality is implemented is going to be important. And a few questions that can be asked to get the process started. What's the purpose of the system? Is it to disinfect the surfaces and the air, or is it just to improve indoor air quality and the surfaces aren't important? Is this my primary a uh, set of armor against my pathogens and indoor air quality uh, irritants, or is this supplementary, something I'm adding into a multi-layered approach? What am I looking for? Am I looking for something that can be active and on and supporting while people are in a space, or am I looking for a deep neutralization of pathogens uh, when people are out of a space. Or another way of asking questions, how is the space used? If it's something like a conference room that has a lot of downtime, then maybe you can go focus in on deep disinfection between use. While if it's something like a classroom that's on, you know, that's you know used for most of the day consistently, then maybe looking at a different approach of improving air quality while people are in the space. Some other things we want to look at are going to be room dimensions, reflectance of different materials. Yes, UV doesn't reflect well, but it does some. And so we can go and get a little bit of a higher output from highly reflective surfaces. Furniture layout, airflow. Uh, more airflow is going to correlate to a higher rate of disinfection. Usage and purpose of the space. Again, when is the space used? Why is the space used? Is this a gym where a lot of people are breathing heavily? Is this a place where only one person is spending time, a private office perhaps? And what's the schedule of operation? From there, once you start to understand what we're looking for, then the next question is what technology do we implement? And so when we're looking at technology, we have different types of bulb types to emit our UVC lighting. The most commonly used one today is going to be low pressure mercury. Uh, this is essentially the same technology as fluorescent lamps. It's a slightly different coating of the lamp and a slightly different gas mixture inside that's going to create that 254 nanometer UV light. The benefit here is that the price uh, is 
pretty low. It's an affordable solution. And the efficacy, the UV output is pretty high, and the lifespan is definitely not bad. About 10 to 12,000 hours of good working life with this technology. There is a slow deterioration over time, and there is a small trace amount of mercury inside the lamp, so uh, disposal needs to be done properly. Next up, we have Eximer technology. This is going to be the realm of 222 uh, nanometer UV. This is going to be a different operation of lighting a different chemical cocktail inside. Uh, it needs to be stoked by a very high voltage. Uh, but the nice part with 222 with Eximer light technology is that it's an instant on. There's no warm up time associated. The lifespans are unfortunately not as long right now that they're improving. Uh, we're seeing about uh, eight to 10,000 hours uh, towards a higher limit of total on time. Uh, the, and the costs are higher. Uh, but it's able to generate the 222 nanometers, which has a huge slew of benefits. Uh, we'll talk a little more about that. And again, we'll do a whole uh, webinar on that topic in the future. And then finally, LED. LED, as we know from our standard illumination, is the holy grail. We get all sorts of form with that. We have all sorts of flexibility. We have insane efficacy. We have insanely long lifespans. We have high quality light that's output. Right now, UV LED isn't quite there. It's getting better. It seems every week, every month, a new advance has been taken, but they still haven't found the proper combination of metals and minerals to emit UV light at a dosage, at a efficacy, and at a lifespan that makes sense. Right now, to get an equivalent to a low pressure mercury lamp is going to be a radically high price um, to do that. And the heat dissipation will be an issue as well. So certain applications, LED is going to be proper, uh, but for mass deployment, it's, it's almost there, but it's not quite there. Now we have wavelengths. Again, not a commodity. And this, if you're new to the realm, I know that it might seem like a lot, uh, but give it a little bit of time. It'll become second nature, and I'll try to keep on pointing out the places where uh, we recommend UV being used. So 254 nanometers, as mentioned before, is going to fall in pretty close to what we're seeing to be the peak germicidal efficacy of UV. And this is going to be the place where that DNA and RNA of rupturing effect is the highest. 254 is not quite there, but 254 can be generated by low pressure mercury lamps. So it makes it economically feasible uh, and it makes it feasible in terms of dosage and output. 254, again, is going to be a place where long-term direct exposure can cause um, temporary damage. The uh, TLV, the limit, uh, you know, recommend a limited value from the ACGIH is six millijoules per uh, centimeter squared over an eight hour period. And just for reference to go and get a treatment of COVID uh, or SARS-CoV-2 at about 99.9% .9 disinfection is going to be about 3.7 millijoules per centimeter squared um, total. So in terms of the treatment, we have a higher threshold, but still something that we'd want to avoid being directly under. Now we're able to get much closer to that peak value using LED UV technology. So that's another promise of that technology. Uh, unfortunately, again, the output right now isn't quite where it needs to be. 185 nanometers is going to be another wavelength that you might see here and there, 180, 185 nanometers. And this is the realm of the snake oil salesman, in my opinion here. This is the realm of the Wild West um, of Amazon.com and one of the places where it is important to be educated because at 185 nanometers, ozone generation is a side effect. Now, ozone in of itself is wonderful for disinfecting all sorts of pathogens, but it is also wonderful at causing a lot of damage to our respiratory system, long-term lasting damage. We should not be in spaces where there's high amounts of ozone. 
And so what we've seen is on Amazon, these nice, clever marketing that says dual use disinfection, uh, ozone and UV light. Uh, please stay away from those devices unless you are very consciously and properly looking to harness the power of ozone, uh, which again, I'm not going to recommend for high traffic facilities because it will require at least a couple hours of airtime before uh, those areas are safe for entrance again. 222 nanometers. Now, here it says new research, and that's a bit of a misnomer. This There's been consistent research on 222 or far UV for a while. It's actually a range of around 200 to 230 nanometers, uh, which is far UV. They've been consistently researching this for about 20, 25 years at this point. And what we're seeing is that there is no damage at all to mammalian skin and eyes over uh, essentially any dosage that's been tested. Now, there is still a little research to be done on non-mammalians, um, but so far, so good there. But for the sake of direct exposure to humans in a working space or in an occupied space, uh, this is a place where we can get direct surface treatment while occupied. We can get radical air quality improvements and air disinfection in occupied spaces. And we can also do this at another uh, type of treatment. This is the realm where we're able to kill or disrupt the proteins in the cell wall and actually go and kill uh, bacteria and viruses. So we get double duty and a lot of those dosages required are going to be lower at uh, 222 rather than 254. There are still limitations that are set by the ACGIH, but we're seeing it seems like an annual basis, those radically rising. So for a comparison's sake, six millijoules was the 254 limit. Uh, at last look, I believe the 222 is 164 millijoules per centimeter squared. Uh, so that's a radical difference. and an, dosage that would be achieved uh, anyway throughout the day, uh, even though it's been scientifically proven to be safe. And the last dosage to mention here is 405 nanometers. This is technically not UV. This is technically very violet light, uh, but it has a low amount of efficacy against bacteria and against viruses. It is visible light. It's completely safe to be under, but the Metaphor that I've heard once that I like is comparing 405 versus 254, 222 is comparing rocks versus missiles. So there is promise with 405. It could be incorporated to LED chips. It can be incorporated into our standard LED fixtures. And so we get a very, very, very low dose of extra support. Uh, but as a primary means of disinfection, it's not going to be a sustainable way of doing so. Again, uh, there are a few products on the market that are promising a lot that way. I do very much recommend diving into their white papers and looking at the time it takes to achieve their promises. Because if it's taking multiple months, uh, as 405 typically does, what you're going to see is that novel pathogens enter that space throughout that time. And theoretically, it might sound good, but practically it doesn't really uh, do much of anything. All right, and different types of delivery methods. Again, I'm going to go through really quick, and I'd be happy to dive in uh, during Q&A with any of these solutions. So the first one here, this let's say the simplest, is going to be direct application of UVC light. Uh, we call this whole room or direct uh, UV. Benefits here, surface and air treatments. You're able to achieve radically high levels of disinfection. And uh, the best way to achieve this is either through making sure a space is empty and pretty much barring that space off and or incorporating some safety redundancies such as inverse motion sensors to turn off the lights if motion or occupancy is detected, scheduling functionality to turn these on when no one's going to be in the space. Uh, you can put on room locks. You can also put on audible enunciation to announce its operation. So again, for unoccupied space, but you can get radically high uh, rates of on-demand disinfection. You can do the same through portable units. So you can have it via fixed in the ceiling, you know, right in the ceiling grid. 
Uh, you can have it portable. So portables can be cheaper. It's going to be uh, in some ways efficacious because you can go and get under tables and you can get more of the ground level. Uh, but it requires some more manual power. This is something we've seen on the market. Uh, it's something that we've seen as a nice supplementary addition to a disinfection plan of a facility. Uh, so definitely something good to have out there. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it necessarily as the primary means because of the uh, still the limitations associated with what we saw on the slide before. We have handheld. Uh, this is, again, I keep on mentioning Amazon, and I live in the city of Amazon, so I'm afraid that the successor of Mr. Bezos is going to be knocking on my door soon, or a little drone will fly fly down and leave me uh, something not so good. But it's true. It's what we saw. And again, I think they've taken some great steps at uh, putting you know, the Amazon police on mitigating some of the products that they have on the market there. Because... A lot of these handheld units are not going to be efficacious. You might see a lot of them. Most of the time when people are using a handheld unit, they hold it, they wave it like this, and then they take it somewhere else. Dosage equals light intensity times time. Most of these are battery powered. The, dose, the intensity isn't high. The time isn't there. So what you just did was nothing at all except waste some nice hard-earned money. These can be used uh, if the beam is tightly functioned, if people are trained properly. Uh, but this might be honestly a place where a tiny little bit of a chemical disinfectant might be better uh, to go and spot clean. Uh, so again, personally, I'm not a huge fan, but I did want to address it because it's something that you'll see you'll see out there uh, a good amount. Upper air. So upper air is something we've seen a lot of. It was something that was used very much in the 50s and 60s in tuberculosis wards. Uh, so the idea with upper air is to shine UV light up towards the upper quadrant or the upper third of the space in a room. There's natural convention currents inside of a room as people walk and breathe. So the hot air rises, gets purified, cools off and falls back down. And so this is a great way of treating the air in occupied spaces. Reduce pathogens um, and you're going to be able to as well um, you know, have this on in occupied spaces. Now you will not get a surface level disinfection and this does need to be mounted at least, they say seven feet high. Um, I don't like to mount it any lower than eight or nine feet because at seven feet, if you step back or if you're tall enough or if you raise your hands up, you can still be in the line of sight. But in places with high ceilings, these are wonderful, wonderful options. In places with good airflow, this is a wonderful option. And again, it's a relatively affordable and simple to implement option. The last thing to note here is that if you are using 254 nanometer technology, uh, the low pressure mercury lamps will produce a blue light. The blue light is not UV. It's a byproduct of the light. Uh, it's visible light, but there isn't a way of making fully invisible UV light with low pressure mercury systems, meaning that there'll be a small degree of blue light emanating from these technologies. So in a space like a hallway, not a big deal in a theater space, uh, maybe not as effective. That's where UV LED, the promise there is beautiful because they can hone in on 265 nanometers, that's invisible light, and have a system that's disinfecting the air inside an occupied space while a performance is happening without disrupting that performance. HVAC based systems. So this is a histor another historic use that we've seen a lot of. Historically, the reason for HVAC usage was going to be primarily for coil cleaning uh, in order to reduce the biofilm on the coil to extend the lifespan of the HVAC system and to improve the airflow through it. Now, uh, what we're seeing is putting in a tighter grid of UV, adding in more UV light there to actually do some disruption and disinfection of the air. Uh, it's a relatively affordable system. It needs to be properly designed and it's still going to be something limited in its efficacy. There's a concept of near versus far air. So the closer that you're disinfecting to the source of people and pathogens, the more efficacious it'll be. 
with an HVAC system, there can be cross-contamination between different rooms. It's only pulling in the local air to the HVAC system. And so supplement as a supplementary system, wonderful, highly recommended new constructions um, as a primary system. It, it still, um, still leaves a lot uh, requested. And then finally, at the bottom of the page here, uh, you'll see, I know more. it's more on the East Coast where I grew up. You'll see these uh, unit vents inside classrooms, inside older offices. Um, there are ways to treat those. That's going to be a bit more of an efficacious system uh, because you do get a lot of the local air, uh, you know, air blowing in from this. And so again, near air versus far air. Just air purifiers. Uh, so in case the HVAC isn't enough, in case you're looking to supplement it, uh, there can be internal uh, you know, purification of air. With the IAQ webinar, we're going to talk a lot about um, fresh air. And bringing in fresh air is one of the best ways of improving IAQ. Unfortunately, those living in congested cities, those living in places where there's wildfires, uh, and those living in rural areas next to livestock farms, uh, are all going to be places where opening the window may do more harm than good. And so to go and improve the quality of air, there can be air, just you know simple air purifiers that are running through a UV light, maybe through a mixture of different filters like a HEPA and an active carbon filter. Uh, so a nice addition and a supplement. No surface level disinfection. Uh, limited in terms of its efficacy, and again, another wild west place. So you'll have to make sure that the CFMs, uh, the cubic feet per minute, are getting you two, three, maybe five, six air exchanges per hour, which is going to be more in line with um, the limits and guidelines of ASHRAE. All right, so we're almost through here. I know I'm throwing a lot of different solutions at you, but I want to, you know, get you excited about the potential here, get you thinking about the potential here. And I want you to ask questions and give me impetus to dive into the weeds with future uh, AI webinars because we're booked through uh, now through February and I'm scratching the back of my head trying to figure out what we'll do in March. So uh, hopefully I, I stoke the interest enough to give, give a few more topics for us to present. But anyway, let's continue back here. So what we have here is going to be hybrid. So you can incorporate multiple technologies together, right? So you can have surface level disinfection and air disinfection, right? So while space is unoccupied, there's surface level, deep level of air purification because of all the light that is, you know, from point A, the light source to B, the surface, all the air between is being disinfected as well. And then while the space is occupied, you can have air filtration going on, maybe adding in some filters like a HEPA and a carbon filter as well, running through UV light. So by combining technologies together, by combining different protocols together, you're able to make radical improvements of IAQ. Again, we'll talk about this, but typically there are about five to six times more uh, particulates inside of indoor air quality than outdoor air quality. In some of these settings, like cities, like you know areas near livestock farms, like you know areas currently experiencing wildfires, we can make the quality of air inside better than outside, and it's not something that's too radically different, difficult, or expensive to do. All right. So I mentioned FAR UV. We'll do a whole webinar on this. It warrants a whole webinar. Um, and the idea here is you have technology that can clean surface and air in occupied spaces. There are still limits in terms of the output. Um, there are still limits in terms of some of the dosages. There are still some limits, limits due to some uh, IP law that's happening in the States. Uh, as an engineer, um, I don't love that some of our... Um, R&D is being hamstrung by uh, by IP law, but you know it, it's part it's part and parcel to the whole process here. So uh, we're doing what we can, and it still is a very efficacious and interesting emerging tech. So uh, definitely worth talking about. We'll talk more about that in February, and I can answer more during Q and A if you're interested. 
And then a question that we hear all the time. And so uh, it warranted here a whole description. Uh, and this is something we'll talk during our lighting controls webinar more about. And it's going to be lighting controls. It's going to be an ability to control these UV devices, the scheduling of them, the sensitivity of the sensors, the way that they're used uh, locally, remotely, but to have that functionality. We want to create, it's important with any of these systems, future ready solutions. We know what dosage is required to kill SARS-CoV-2. We don't know what it's going to be for the next hopefully not pandemic, but the next thing that comes out. And so it's important to have systems that can be flexible enough to address whatever current need there is, whether it's a pathogen, whether it's a gas in the air, whatever it might be. And so to have local controls, and then also to bring in the people, the residents of an apartment building, the occupants of an office building, the students and staff and parents in the school system, to let them know what the facility managers, what the building decision makers are doing through reports, through improving confidence inside those people is gonna be something that uh, implementing germicidal systems provides as well. And so looking at solutions along those lines uh, is a adder uh, that can be brought in. And especially as we start looking more into IoT-based systems where we have unified buildings, this is a way to uh, incorporate smart technology through the whole building technology infrastructure. So we have some time left. Um, I'll hang out as long as, um, as there's new questions that come. Uh, thank you all for listening to this large in-depth um, but very consolidated webinar on UV lighting. Again, I'm happy to take questions. If you have them, put them in the Q&A module, uh, please not in the chat. Um, and we'll follow up with a, a link to the recording so you can share with any colleagues. If you haven't provided your AIA number and you're looking for credits already, uh, please send that via email. When we send you the follow-up, we'll let you know if we have your AIA number or not. If we uh, do, we'll send you a certificate. If not, please reply back with it so we can get you your uh, LUHSW credit. And again, I hope you'll join me regardless for some future webinars. Next month, we're going to talk about stage and theater lighting for schools. Uh, we'll go into IAQ IQ in December and we're going to dive into lighting controls in January and uh, we don't have it here but in February we'll talk about far UV uh, t22 nanometer UV technologies all right so thanks again and let's turn it over to Q and a gonna give a little bit of time to drink some water here Great. If you don't mind, I'm going to stop the screen share. I get a whole lot of me here. All right. All right. So, first question that I have, um, and that's going to be uh, essentially is there funding from the Clean Air and Buildings Challenge? Uh, so, is there publicly awarded funding? So, uh, yes and no. For schools, there was the ESSER funding, and there still is some ESSER funding available. Um, I know that. Uh, limits for ESSER 3 are up to 2024. Uh, germicidal implementations will count for it. Uh, we just completed, personally, our, our team, uh, the first phase in a large project in a 50-plus uh, school district down south, uh, and they were applying the entire thing for the ESSER funding, a multi-million dollar project there. So it's definitely available there. Directly through the Clean Air and Buildings Challenge, no, uh, it is more of a call for action at this point, but I would not be surprised if uh, funding is released uh, via some sort of um, rebate program over the next uh, couple months or years. Okay, so next question. Uh, yeah, I'll just consolidate this. So it's you know, I mentioned IAQ a lot, and I mentioned with IAQ things like CO2, ozone, particulates in the air. And so the question was if uh, UV light addresses anything else other than uh, pathogens. So UV light in of itself will be able to disassemble some VOCs. Um, so they'll be able to go and 
turn the VOCs into constituent parts. Usually that's going to be H2O um, and O2. Uh, so the type of air we breathe and water vapor, not all VOCs. Uh, it is going to be able to, uh, for mold spores, it will be able to go and treat mold spores. So it's going to be a major allergen. But when we're talking about other VOCs, we're talking about CO2. Uh, we're talking about ozone. Uh, actually, ozone, yes, it's, sorry, it will disrupt ozone. Um, it will turn O3 to O2. But with CO2, with some of our large particulates, that's where combining in some other modalities is going to be very convenient. HEPA filtration, active carbon filtration as well, uh, will give a nice um, full spectrum type of solution there. Okay. Sure. So, um, question about what I was talking about the IP with 222. Um, we'll talk more about this in February, but just as a little bit right here. So right now there is one company that has um, an IP that pretty much forces North American based implementations to use their technology. Not quite a monopoly because it is a specific enough patent that essentially doesn't let anyone else in get involved with the technology because there's alternative technology that can be used, uh, but it's very expensive and not really very efficacious. So uh, kind of a interesting quagmire that they have. Fortunately, the tech itself is pretty good uh, and it can be used, but because they are essentially single source right now, the pricing is higher than I would like it to be. And it makes it a little bit more limited in terms of what facilities can do. Again, we could talk more in March about that, or we can talk off the webinar, but the q and is still being recorded, so that's all I'll say. All right. Cool. So next question that I'm seeing here, and I mentioned it during the webinar, but I'll mention it again, is, yeah, the facilities that had um, UVC inside of their HVAC systems that did get hit by COVID pretty hard. Again, dosage equals light intensity times time. And so because air is going through an HVAC system so quickly and the uh, UV lights there aren't set for incredibly high dosages because they're set to treat the biofilm that develops on coils. So they have essentially perpetual long-term dosages. They're shining on for 24 hours a day. So the air that's passing through and the dosage that's coming from the light source uh, aren't matching up. The dosage coming from the light source is too weak. The air passing through is not holding for long enough. So the actual disinfection rate is very small. So that's why a lot of these you know, units that have, weren't put in place with HVAC, uh, but not meant for the pathogenetic uh, purposes weren't really doing too much. And so on the flip side of that, if you are implementing UV inside of your HVAC unit, it does have to be that scientific approach. And there is a chance through the grid that you'll experience some pressure drops and the air might not be able to flow as fast because there's obstacles in the way. So uh, that'll have to be taken into consideration as well in the development. And I think I got one more question here. Cool. And I think that that's around the same. And we'll talk more about this again in March. Um, and that's why, yeah, so the question is, why aren't there more FAR-222 implementations? Why haven't I seen more of them out there? There are. There's a good amount. Uh, we're seeing more and more. There's some uh, great companies out there doing good work there. Um, I'll stake blue product agnostic for this conversation. But one of the major things that we are seeing is, uh, again, people being priced out. Uh, so it is dependent on the buyer. That's why, again, this is an engineered solution and finding the proper application for the proper budget with the proper safety features um, looked into it as well. With more also of this national movement on IAQ, we are seeing more investment and uh, prioritizing of these investments for these facilities. And so 
uh, now that you might be looking out for these implementations more, you might start to see them a little bit more, or you might be the one of the people to, um, you know, start really pushing that forward because it is something that is the way for the future, is um, a new paradigm in building uh, management and building construction and building design. And so we do need the, uh, the visionaries to move that forward. So I think that's a good way to close out the webinar here to thank you for listening and uh, ideally being those visionaries and uh, being on the cutting edge. Uh, so again, thank you very much. We'll follow up the webinar uh, with your certificate. Any other questions, please reach out to us. Uh, we're always happy to geek out and talk some more. And again, hopefully I'll see you on a future webinar. All right, all. Thanks again and have a wonderful Thursday, a great Friday and an even better weekend. Bueno.